Okay guys, we are starting our final unit of the semester. It's a fairly short unit. Um, it is on evolution. Today's PowerPoint is the mechanisms of evolution, how this actually happens. And you should have your notes organizer in front of you that was given in class. If you don't have it, you can print it from the blog. So we're going to be talking about evolution, which is the change in a population over time or a change in a species, not change in an individual organism. So let's talk about what a species is before we can discuss how the how a species or a group of organisms can um, possibly change. So a species are organisms which are capable of two things. First of all, reproduction in their natural environment and their offspring are what are considered fertile, meaning their offspring have to be able to produce more offspring. So those two things make up a species. A group made up of members of the same species is also known as a population. So I'm going to use those two terms sort of interchangeably, species and population. They mean the same thing. So I'm going to give you some scenarios. You tell me if those would be members of the same species or members of different species. Horses and donkeys can mate to produce mules. Mules are sterile, meaning they are infertile. Are horses and donkeys members of the same species? Obviously no, because their offspring can't produce offspring, so that doesn't fit that definition. So horses and donkeys are different species. Are all birds members of the same species? Could an ostrich mate with a hummingbird? No, so that means they are different species. Different birds are different species. An owl is not the same species as a penguin, for example. What about dogs? Like the common domesticated dog. Can all dogs mate? Theoretically, all dogs can mate. If they could figure it out, a Great Dane could mate with a Chihuahua. It's Canis familiaris. That's the scientific name of, of your domesticated dog. Um, they all technically could mate. Obviously, there, there would be some physical difficulties, but theoretically, they could. What about lions and tigers? We know those ligers or tigons, right? Are they considered to be different species? Lions and tigers can be bred to produce ligers. Um, and we recently found out that ligers can produce more ligers or tigons can produce more tigons, so they are fertile. But lions and tigers are still considered to be different species. Why do you think that is? What was the second portion of our definition of a species? That they can produce fertile offspring, we talked about that, but what was the other one? That they reproduce in their natural habitat. Lions and tigers and their natural settings will never come in contact with one another. So that is why we still consider lions and tigers to be different species. Okay, so now we have our background definition of species. Let's talk about what evolution is and where did this sort of um, idea of evolution come from. Obviously, the name most associated with evolution is Charles Darwin. He was the first person to really propose this idea that species can change over time. And he was a British naturalist in the early 1800s. And obviously, naturalist is just like what it sounds like. They're hired to study nature. So he was hired to travel on the ship called the HMS Beagle during the 1830s in order to learn as much as he could about the living things he saw on the voyage. Sounds like a pretty cool job, a job I would want to have. So the Beagle traveled to the Galapagos Islands of South America. So they traveled sort of this direction here, made their way to the Galapagos Islands right off the coast of Ecuador. And here is where Darwin really made some of his most important observations in relation to his founding uh, the idea of evolution. So he studied these finches, he studied with iguanas, he studied tortoises, and we're going to talk about a couple of those. Most importantly, I think, were his studies of the finches. This is where he spent most of his time. He made all these sort of detailed um, drawings and recordings of what he saw. So what he saw was that the finches, and the finches are they're these very small birds, the finches from one island to the next had very different beaks. They were significantly different. So like you can see here, this beak is very broad. <clears throat> this beak here is very pointy, very small. Um, and what he noticed was that each beak was well suited to the environment where that finch was found. So on the islands where there were tons of insects, the, the birds there had very sharp needle-like beaks. On the islands where there are many seeds that would have to be cracked, he found that the birds had these big, strong, wide beaks. He saw something very similar with iguanas. He noticed that the mainland iguanas were very different from the iguanas that lived on the islands. The island iguanas had very large claws, while the mainland iguanas had very small claws. And when he looked sort of further into that, he realized that 
those types of claws were very beneficial to the life that it led. The large claws of the island iguanas kept them from slipping off the rocks, while the small claws of the mainland iguanas allowed them to climb the trees where they ate leaves. So he took his work you know, back home, sort of went through his drawings, went through his recordings, and, and started coming up with these ideas of how all of this happened. How do we end up with finches that have significantly different types of beaks? So he reasoned that the finches on each of the Galapagos Islands must face environmental conditions that are different from one another. So he came up with the conclusion that species or populations much gra must gradually change over many generations, becoming better adapted to their environment. The key here is not that he said, oh, well, uh, a finch on the island with seeds that had a small beak would just grow a large beak. That was sort of an, an antiquated way of thinking. You know, Lamarck came up with this idea that giraffes um, needed to stretch their necks to get to the taller leaves, so one single giraffe would, would just stretch his neck until eventually, it, you know, it, it would have a long neck and its children would have a long neck. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about adaptations or traits that help an organism survive and reproduce in its environment um, are going to make that organism more likely to, sur to survive, they're more, for, for more likely to reproduce, and then those traits are going to be passed on to future generations until eventually those future generations all have that wide, strong beak made for cracking seeds or whatever trait it is that you're talking about. So that gradual change in a population over time is known as evolution. So this is all on your notes organizer. We are on 2E. And what we're talking about here is the theory of evolution. And sometimes we like to throw around the, that word theory to mean just sort of like an educated guess. But in terms of science, what is a scientific theory? It's a well-tested te concept that explains a wide range of observations, meaning it's an explanation that is supported by significant evidence in different forms and that has been sort of determined by scientists to be true based on all of this research that has been done. So the theory of evolution is what scientists have concluded to be true regarding how species change over time. This explanation is based on significant amounts of research, observations, and many sources of evidence. This is number three and four. <coughs> So we have the theory of gravity. Obviously, we can't see gravity, but we can see the results of gravity. We can see sort of gravity in action. That's why it's the theory of gravity, this sort of explanation of this force um, that's based on apples falling from trees. That's a lot of data that we have to support the idea of gravity. Now, if all of a sudden apples started floating upwards, we would change our thinking of the theory of gravity. The same thing for evolution. We can't see evolution in action, but we can see the effects of evolution. We can see the effects of natural selection. So that's what we're talking about today is what we have concluded based on all the research that we have at hand. So Darwin explained that species must change over time as a result of what he called natural selection. So natural selection, let's break that down. The selecting done by nature, natural selection, also known as survival of the fittest. Um, you've probably heard that term before, is the process by which the environment selects the most well-adapted organisms for reproduction. So the nature is doing the selecting based on the environmental stressors or the environmental situation. The organisms most likely to survive in that environment, most well-adapted organisms are more likely to reproduce and therefore more likely to pass those tra traits on to future generations. Now remember, fittest does not always mean strongest. Fittest means best adapted. Fitness is a measurement of adaptation, how well an organism is adapted to its environment. So that might mean strongest, or that might mean um, darkest colored, or that might mean fastest, or that might mean uh, smallest. You just never know depending on what type of environment that organism is living in. So Charles Darwin, along with the biologist Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace, pub published his explanation in a book called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And this is a very long book that he, that he compiled over very many years, and it wasn't until the very last page of this book, The Origin of Species, that he ever even used the term evolution. So it's very interesting that we sort of associate that term with Charles Darwin.
Okay, so what was the origin of species about? It was about the mechanisms of evolution. Like I said, he didn't use that term until the end. He mostly spent those pages discussing how this actually happens. And there were three big ideas that he say must sort of um, push natural selection along, and that was overproduction, competition, and genetic variation, and we're going to talk about each of these three things. So overproduction is as simple as it sounds. It's the production of many more offspring than can possibly survive, and sea turtles are a great example of overproduction. One single sea turtle can lay more than 100 eggs. They can lay like 200 eggs in one single um, season. Now obviously, if all of those 200 eggs survived, the sea, the sea would be full of sea turtles, but that's obviously not the case. So out of a nest of 200 eggs, maybe two or three might survive. So overproduction introduces competition, making it more likely that only the members with the best adaptations are going to survive, therefore reproduce, therefore those, those adaptations are going to be passed on to future generations. So you should be filling in the chart here under number seven on your notes organizer. Frog eggs are obviously an example of overproduction. If all of these eggs survived in, into adult frogs, you know, the world would be taken over by frogs. That's obviously not the case. Out of this huge nest, you may only have a couple dozen that survive into adulthood. And those are going to be the ones best adapted to the environment. Maple seeds, we all see these. Helicopters floating down. Most of those are not going to germinate. Okay, next came the idea that competition must be a factor that affects natural selection. And you're very familiar with competition, so I'm going to move through these pretty fast. So competition, competition is organisms aiming to utilize the same resources. And resources are things like food, water, living space, mate, mates, all of that sort of stuff. Um, offspring must compete with each other in order to survive. So because of competition, the most well-adapted organisms are going to be the ones that survive in that environment. Therefore, they're going to be more likely to reproduce. Therefore, those beneficial traits are going to be passed on to future generations. So there's your definition. Here are your examples. Obviously, back to the sea turtles, they're going to be, those little sea turtle hatchlings are going to be competing for a lot of things right in the very beginning. They're going to be competing for a space. They're going to be competing for um, nutrients in the beginning. And the last factor that affects the process of natural selection determined by Charles Darwin was genetic variation. And we discussed this a lot in our genetics unit, that variations are any differences between individuals in the same species. Obviously, that's a result of alleles being passed down. Um, you know, the shuffling of alleles during meiosis, during crossing over, mutations, all of that introduces genetic variation. So a strong species is one in which there are many differences between individuals. So more genetic variation equals an overall stronger species or populations. Variations increase the likelihood that some individuals will survive despite changes in the environment. So let's take a crop, for example, corn. If all corn were genetically identical, and let's say that corn was susceptible to some type of pest, if that pest was introduced into that environment, how much of our genetically identical corn would survive? None, right? Well, let's say I'm a farmer and I plant a very um, genetically diverse crop of corn this year. Some of it are susceptible to that pest and some of it are not. Um, what happens when that pest is introduced to that environment? Is all my crop going to die? No, some of my crop is going to survive, so that's obviously beneficial to me. So a strong population is one in which there are many differences. So again, variations. You have in the sea turtles, some are born with different sizes, different speeds, different colors. Some are fast on land, others are fast swimmers. Some are darker colored, some are lighter colored. It's this variation that ensures the survival of the species as a whole. So this is sort of what I was talking about with the identical corn. Clones have identical genes and are therefore strong and weak in the same areas. So one event, like a drastic environmental change, a new germ, a loss of a food source, can wipe out an entire population. Genetic variation means that not all members of a population are susceptible to the same Ill illnesses, environmental changes, etc. The individuals best fit for the environmental conditions survive and pass their traits to the next generation. Okay, so here's number eight on your notes organizer. Just like I was talking about with the corn, the lack of variation in these potatoes. 
um, wipes them out due to a single fungus, similar with antibiotic resistance here. And I will stop here for today.